All opinions expressed by Adam, Tyler, and podcast guests are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinion of real crowd. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. To gain a better understanding of the risks associated with commercial real estate investing, please consult your advisors. Hey listeners, Adam here. Have you ever wondered if you're investing in the right real estate deals? What about if you're making the right decisions for your overall financial health? Over the last seven years of running Real Crowd, the number one question we received from investors is, should I invest in this deal? Well, we're excited to announce that we can now help you answer that question. Through our sister company, Reallocate, and through Reallocate's partnership with Mariner Wealth Advisors, you can now have access to teams dedicated to helping you build a real estate portfolio based on your personal investment roadmap and financial goals. If you'd like to learn more about how Reallocate can help you, head to buildmyroadmap.com. Again, that's buildmyroadmap.com. Hey, Tyler. Hey, Adam. How are you today? Tyler, I'm doing well as we brace for uh, finally winter coming here in Portland. Yeah. Big yeah. snowstorm coming here. Are, are you ready for it? Well, forecast is somewhere between four and 17 inches, which means we're probably going to get like a light rain. So <laughs> yeah. I think I think we'll do okay. Um, but, you know, we did we did visit our, our local retail stores and shopped in preparation for that, which is a nice little segue into uh, our conversation today. It sure is. Today we had Dusty Batzel, who is the executive vice president of real estate at Baseline Group. Yeah, so we've had uh, Todd Laurie from Baseline uh, come on the show before mm-hmm. and talk about how they look at retail space, and, and Dusty was kind enough to join us from Baseline again to give us a little bit of a rundown on how they view retail in the market right now, mm-hmm. you know, how their acquisitions pipeline looks, and talk about some of the trends that they're seeing within their tenant base, as I think he said, over 900 tenants that they have in their portfolio. So they've got a pretty good, pretty good window into how uh, different businesses are performing throughout this crisis. Yeah. Yeah, and, and Dusty did go over, you know, what's performing well right now throughout the crisis, what's struggling. Um, so it was interesting to hear the different tenant mix and tenant profiles that are doing well, you know, as we're all trying to adjust to this new normal. Yeah, and you'll hear again similar threads that we've we've pulled on uh, with prior episodes of what are some of those changes that they're seeing right now that might outlast this current crisis and and become more of a a longer term trend and and then also how some of those trends that they were seeing before have accelerated during this crisis, right? More emphasis mm-hmm. on the service retail, um, more emphasis on medical use going into retail as they try to get closer to their, their users rather than being, you know, in, um, more kind of on campus medical use. So really good, just kind of fundamental overview mm-hmm. of, of how they see retail right now and, and where they see some of the opportunities going forward uh, here in 2021 as, as they look at different acquisition pipelines. Yeah. And speaking of acquisition pipelines, we talked a bit about pricing, what they're seeing from sellers and whether prices are dropping or what's happening at the negotiation level uh, to get some retail transactions going. Uh, so we talked about transactions, which was great. And we also talked about rental rates and what's happening as far as rental rates with tenants has COVID impacted those rates or or not and and why yeah and also be sure to listen for uh, Dusty's take on the resilience of their portfolio and and what they've seen in the space I think surprising to a lot of us based on where we would have expected uh, you know early last year and mid last year a lot of good reports that they have out of their portfolio which is which is always nice to hear yeah yeah overall it was great to have Dusty on to just give us some mm-hmm. insight into what he's seeing. Perfect. And I guess, you know, that's a good uh, good prompt if any listeners out there, if you want us to cover anything in specific or any any questions you'd like us to dig into on the show, uh, send us a note to podcast at realcrowd.com. We love hearing from you guys. Uh, but Tyler, with that, let's get to it. Dusty, thank you so much for for joining us today. We're excited to have another member of the Baseline crew back on the podcast and and tell us a little bit what's going on in the retail space right now. Glad to be here. Thank you guys for having me. So for listeners that maybe haven't caught uh, Todd's prior episode, um, tell us maybe a little bit about what Baseline does, what you guys focus on, and and how did you end up there, and what does your day-to-day look like? Sure. So, you know, Baseline, we're a private equity real estate investment firm, started in 2003 as a property management company, um, shifted over into the 
actual investment side, the principal side, started with a few no debt funds back in the day mm -hmm. and then have since transitioned and started this aggregation strategy probably oh, five years ago before I had returned to baseline. And, and the goal there, you know, we started to use a little bit of leverage. The goal there was to use all of the knowledge that we had gained over the last 10 years at the time to you know, really build this institutional quality, institutional size portfolio of neighborhood shopping centers. You know, it's a, it's a market that, or uh, excuse me, a product type that we have become very familiar with, mm -hmm. that we very much believe in. You know, one of our big taglines is, you know, we invest in communities and, and that's exactly what we're trying to do by buying these neighborhood shopping centers, you know, provide a place for the local communities to uh, gather, uh, get their everyday needs, you know, go to their local restaurant, get their nails and hair done. You know, we found this to be just an extremely reliable and predictable um, business mm -hmm. uh, model for us. And it's, it's, you know, performed very well. So we're excited about what the future holds. And at me in particular, I'm the, uh, I oversee all the real estate operations. So you know, everything that rolls up to me, you know, leasing, asset management, acquisitions, dispositions, and really just trying to set the strategy, make sure that we're taking a, you know, both a broad, you know, holistic view of, of the market and the industry and where things are going, you know, but also making sure that we've got our information dialed in from a, you know, due diligence standpoint, from an asset management standpoint to ensure that we're maximizing return for our investors. Mm -hmm. And now before we get into more specifically what, what you guys are up to, maybe you can help us kind of set the stage for listeners that are maybe new to the show or haven't heard some of the other retail episodes. How do you guys look at the different asset profiles within retail, right? Needs-based, um, grocery, maybe big box, strip centers. You know, how do you guys split the the universe of retail assets? And, and then what do you guys look at, I guess, differently across those maybe? Yeah, sure. So, you know, I think everyone have, probably has a pretty good general concept of what retail is. You know, everyone's familiar with going to a big shopping mall or, you know, going to a power center, which would include, you know, your Best Buy next to a TJ Maxx, you know, and the Costco across the street, and then, you know, going to your grocery anchored center. So your grocery store that you go to, you know, on a weekly basis that also has some small shop space that's attached to it. Um, those are none of the things that we invest in. <laughs> we look for the unanchored centers, you mm -hmm. know, the true on the corner, you know, anywhere from 15 to 50,000 square feet, a lot of shorter depth, uh, excuse me, bay depths, um, anywhere from 12 to typically 2,500 square foot spaces. So a lot of the smaller shops. So, you know, think about that standalone uh, retail center that's on the corner that has, you know, maybe it has a Starbucks in it. You know, maybe it has a, again, the hair salon or nail salon or a liquor store or, you know, any of those really essential day-to-day -day mm -hmm. uses. Um, we're actually starting to see a little bit more, you know, you might, it might be where you go to your dentist or, go to see your primary care physician, we're seeing that trend pick up steam mm -hmm. with medical users taking these spaces that are closer to the rooftops, you know, as opposed to being in a central medical district where, you know, their customers have to go you know, park in a big parking garage and, and walk over to this building and go a bunch, or excuse me, go up an elevator. You know, we're seeing people want to get closer to their customers. So that's the type of uh, asset that we are looking to buy and, you know, looking to again, continue to grow our portfolio with. So, you know, we avoid the the mall stuff, the power center stuff and mm -hmm. grocery anchor. Perfect. And now I think just as we, as we have the conversation, one of the continual threads that we've touched on for the last 11, 12 months now is this COVID as being an accelerant of some of these trends that were already underway. And obviously early days of COVID, everybody was screaming how retail is dead. Retail is never going to be the same. Um, how was retail coming into this crisis heading into 2020 and maybe where, where have you seen that change and, and what are you guys looking at now in terms of the future of retail, I guess? For our product type, you know, 2019 leading into even bleeding into the first quarter of 2020 was phenomenal. You know, we had a banner year in 2019 in terms of you know, assets acquired in terms of you know, the size of our portfolio from a AUM standpoint, um, the start of 2020 was outpacing 2019. So everything was looking mm -hmm. really good. Again, you know, we, we have to fight this perception issue a lot because retail does get a bad rap. Mm -hmm. You know, you hear about all these 
larger uh, footprint tenants. You know, most recently you can think about in the JC Penney's of the world who, you know, unfortunately have declared bankruptcy and their business model hasn't survived, you know, and everyone quantifies that uh, as retail and, and it falls into that retail bucket, which obviously it is, but it's different from the type of retail that the way we view it. Mm -hmm. Um, so our product type had been doing well, you know, we've, we had seen, uh, you know, occupancy levels had remained high consistent, you know, despite the, the, the claim that retail is dying and everything is moving online. You know, I think it's because a lot of this stuff that we are, are a lot of the tenants that occupy our buildings, you know, offer those, not experiential, but they offer more than you service know, more retail. Yeah, yeah, exactly. More service and more convenience than you know than right now. You know, Amazon or any of those other retailers can provide. And so, how did I guess from from a transaction activity? It sounds like you guys were were ramping up, heading into twenty twenty. What did you guys see in transaction activity in twenty twenty? And here, I guess into early twenty twenty one. Have you guys seen any? Uh, warming up of, of transaction markets. Cause it's something you, we, we, I think a lot of people anticipated by middle of last year that there was going to be a ton of distress and there's gonna be a ton of opportunistic buys out there. And by and large, I don't think we've seen that materialize. So I'm, I'm curious, have you guys seen transaction volume or, um, the, any distress start to show itself in the, in the transaction markets yet? You're, Absolutely right. Let me, I'll talk about the volume first and then get to the distressed. Um, so from a volume standpoint, like I said, the first quarter was really strong for us. We had uh, seven new acquisitions and we had a very deep pipeline of opportunities that we had planned on closing on in you know, Q2 and Q3 and beyond. Mm -hmm. Obviously, when everything hit in March, acquisition activity ground to a halt. There was just too much uncertainty, you know, from our perspective, what we're buying is a, is a stabilized cash flow. You know, we're buying a rent roll of tenants that have been operating or we believe will continue to operate well into the future. Mm -hmm. And when COVID hit and shutdowns were, you know, spreading across the country and businesses were unable to operate, obviously that throws a whole lot of uncertainty as to whether or not these operators are going to be able to, you know, continue to, to survive. So, mm -hmm. you know, we hit the pause button. We did not purchase anything in Q2. We saw things start to thaw out a little bit in Q3. We actually closed on three properties at the end of Q3. We bought another two properties at the end of Q4. We've got two properties that we will be closing on here by the end of Q1, and we expect that velocity to continue to pick up. Um, and that's on your stabilized, typical, you know, what we would consider our uh, fairway product. You know, the, the baseline core income holding, highly stabilized uh, opportunities. From a distress standpoint, we thought the same thing. You know, we saw that this could be a really good opportunity to come help uh, save some of these properties where maybe the landlord you know, was not very well capitalized mm -hmm. and, and couldn't get through uh, those tough times. We have not seen that materialize at all. Um, we think that that probably will continue or will come at some point. You know, like like a lot of landlords were helping their tenants out, providing some type of payment plans or even, you know, full on abatements in some cases, mm -hmm. but you know, you can only do that so long, particularly if you have debt on an asset, you know, right. it's going to be tough to do. And, you know, the banks were being very helpful as well. I think everyone just from, from what we could tell, at least, you know, from our lenders, our tenants and, and obviously ourselves, I mean, this was one of those situations where everyone's going to have to pitch in and, you know, it's going to be a little bit painful for everyone, but you know, as long as everyone agrees that, that we can do that, coming out of this, we're all going to be stronger and, you know, we're, we're going to have uh, more runway. But I do think that, you know, some of that timing is is going to run out. You know, that can't go on forever. So mm -hmm. a lot of the, you know, bank forbearance, um, you know, a lot of the landlords who are giving some type of rent relief, at some point, that's probably going to have to come to an end when things start to return back to normal. And then there's going to be a period of time where these tenants, you know, are going to try and work something out, those that have been most impacted. Uh, so it's, you're just going to have you have to work through that, but eventually we think there will be some distress on the backside of this. It's just trying to identify what the timing is going to be. And have you guys updated your investment thesis or investment strategy at all? Going to, you going to stick to your knitting of the stabilized properties or do you, do you think there's room for opportunistic buys or how does that fit in with your capital profile? Um, so yes and no, we, we won't change our investment profile for you know, our core income fund. Uh, that is you know, done as well. That that is what our full aggregation strategy revolves around. Mm -hmm. We are you know, toying with the idea of of creating something new to 
take advantage of any distress that might be out there. Um, but the whole point of that would also be to find these distressed properties that, but for what's currently going on, would right. qualify to be an ARC or income fund, stabilize them, and then, you know, essentially have the core income fund buy them. Got it. So everything is everything is aligned towards that mission of aggregating and, and building our core income fund. And now you mentioned the, again, a lot of the headlines are with the larger retailers. Uh, obviously, we've seen a bunch of, you know, I think everybody can relate, you know, smaller, maybe restaurants or some of the smaller operators that, that we all used to go to in, in normal times um, right. are, are struggling and, and maybe you know, have closed and, and who knows if they'll open again. So what what types of tenant profiles have you seen that's weathering the crisis better than others? And, and maybe where have you seen some underperformers and any surprises in, in either of those categories? Um, you know, the, the, I would say the people that have been able to weather this the best, uh, and this is just broad retail, not necessarily our tenants, but I'll you know, touch on that as well. I mean, obviously, Groceries, grocery stores have done well. You know, grocers have done mm-hmm. well throughout this. That has been something that I mean, people still need to eat and you know get their daily necessities. So, those guys have done well. Uh, discounters have done well. You know, dollar stores uh, have, have done very well during this period. Um, you know, the some of the vices have done well. Liquor stores obviously have been. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was reading something the other day that uh, 2020 was a banner year for alcohol sales, which you know, no surprise. I right. think a lot of people were. <laughs> coping however they could to get yeah. through this. Um, you know, and then and what we were surprised to see is that once restrictions started to get a little bit more clear, a lot of the appointment based uses were doing better than we had expected, mm. uh, which, which in hindsight makes sense. You know, if, if capacity is limited, um, but if you're going to get your haircut, you know, now you're just going to more of an appointment based model. So instead of sitting there you know, in a row of chairs waiting for your turn, you just show up at a you know, specified time and you know, get your haircut and, and move on. So, you know, I think those types fared a little bit better than we thought. Obviously, QSRs, you know, anybody that uh, pivoted to more pickup and, and had the ability to drive through a delivery, those mm-hmm. guys have been faring well. You know, as far as those that are struggling, um, you know, in our portfolio, what we've seen is, you know, we have a handful of bar and restaurants that maybe had a, a pretty large bar component. Mm-hmm. Obviously, that has just taken a hit because of capacity requirements or restrictions, I should say. Um, individual uses, dry cleaners, that, that has been a use that we've uh, seen. We've had to work with a lot of our dry cleaners just because, you know, people aren't getting weddings or are either canceled or postponed. Uh, people aren't going into the office as much. So, mm-hmm. you know, all the clothes that they would normally get dry cleaned are, are not, you know, people have are working in joggers and sweatshirts from home. No comment. So, <laughs> <laughs> so that's one, you know, that, and, and that's makes sense. You know, that's one that we fully expect will rebound. Once things get back to normal, because uh, I can only imagine that the you know those weddings that had been postponed, you know, like, I can just It'll envision a scenario yeah. where yeah, every venue is about booked you know every day to try and uh, for those folks that have been waiting for their big day, um, and then other uses that rely on uh, more space that have been impacted by capacity restrictions. You know, I think of like dance studios and gyms, where they still have a lot of space, but they can only have twenty five percent of their normal. Mm-hmm crowd in there. Obviously that puts more pressure on their, you know, their overhead and fixed costs. So, um, those are the folks that we've, we've seen that have just needed a little bit more assistance as we get through this. Yeah. And I guess the, you also mentioned the more medical use again, I think that's a trend that we were starting to see mm-hmm. pre COVID. Have you seen that accelerate or, or are there any other new uses that you're seeing accelerated adoption or changes of how we use retail space that'll maybe be a result of, of what we're going through right now and, and coming out of? So we're definitely still seeing the medical trend. Uh, you know, obviously the, the leasing velocity slowed down just a little bit. I mean, we're, we were thrilled to report throughout all of this. We had a net gain in tenants, which, wow. you know, if you would have asked us in April, that is definitely not what we would have projected. Yeah, no um, so, it's, but it hasn't been, you know, quite as high, right? Like it, it, maybe it's 50% of what we would normally expect to do in any given year. But yeah, I would say medical is definitely still a trend of those folks looking for more neighborhood type locations, uh, you know, that are synonymous with what we own. Now, the other thing I, I think we're going to see is just a complete space evaluation, right. if that makes sense. You know, all of these users that you know, think about a restaurant user that maybe pivoted to doing more online orders and doing more delivery and, you know, had to let go some of their staff 
but now they're seeing that they're you know they're not making quite as much top line revenue but maybe they're maintaining the same level of profitability right so so they we're anticipating that we're going to see people that say you know instead of 3000 square feet I only need 2000 square feet and I'm just going to continue with this you know online ordering delivery pickup component but yeah that, that that's the one thing that we see that could happen I mean the counter argument to that is that assumes that people aren't going to want to get back out and, you know, dine in anymore. And I just don't know that that's true. I know, you know, there's pent up demand on my end for sure. about <laughs> Just going to a you know right. restaurant and, you know, having a beer with a friend or whatever. Uh, yeah. I think that's, that's one of the areas that we've also tried to explore is what are, what are some of those longer term trends that we're experiencing now through this very large scale experiment uh, that we think will fundamentally change some of the uses, right? Like you said, maybe reduction in space, um, maybe more restaurants and, and those uses shifting to more of a higher takeout component. And again, like you said, maybe maybe even running that more profitably, right? If you don't have to right. staff a full front of house, uh, you can keep your costs quite low. Um, are there any other interesting responses to this crisis that you've seen that maybe are going to be longer term trends that'll stick once we get through the health side of the crisis? You know, I think in the short term, you're going to see e- even let's just say we're you know six months from now in a fully vaccinated environment and people are going back to normal. I still think you're going to see some hesitation to squeeze all of those tables back together mm-hmm. in quite the same uh, ratio that they were before, which to me says you're probably going to see the extension into the outdoor space uh, that lasts a little bit longer. You know, landlords, I, I can tell you that you know, we were like this as well, have been very open to trying to expand the dining areas for particularly for our restaurants, you know, out into the parking lot or wherever you can find space just so that they can expand their capacity um, through this time. I, I, I can see that continuing because I think from a just a pure experiential standpoint, I think diners, you know, the more outdoor, outdoor space, the better. Now, maybe not at some of our, you know, Chicago or Milwaukee properties right now necessarily, but, mm. you know, in the in the nice weather months, I can see that continuing. Um, you know, I definitely think that anybody who invested the time and resources to pivot to more online ordering, whether that's a restaurant or a small shop or anything, or even the, you know, investing in some software that allows them to, you know, create appointments for their customers. I don't see that going away. I Mm -hmm. think they're going to find that to be, you know, a more efficient use. They've, you know, they've already spent the money on it. So now they can, you know, extend the useful life of it. So I don't see that retreating um you know and i think in general just you'll you'll probably see a lot of these operators continuing to push the message of keeping their employees and customers safe you know i think that's going to be something that stays around for you know a very long time mm-hmm. and then when you when you were looking at uh, consumer behaviors have you have you seen, again, other than the obvious of just, like you said, appointments and, and reduced traffic, um, is there anything that you're learning or, or tracking with how consumers are going to impact that? Right? I mean, like you said, if you go to an appointment and you know you have to be there at a specific time, you're probably not going to spend 15, 20 minutes walking around the other stores, getting your cup of coffee, doing whatever, right? So how, how have you seen consumer behavior, or, or is it too early to really get any inference from how that consumer behavior has changed and what that might mean for some of those other retailers? I think it's a little bit too early to see, you know, what is going to stick just because this shift in consumer behavior now was not a natural one. You know, it was a reactionary one to what's going on. So it's tough to say, in my opinion, what that, what that ultimately looks like when you're coming out of this. I mean, I, I suspect that, you know, from a, from an operator's standpoint, so from a tenant standpoint, you know, like, I envision, I, I wish I would have gotten like the hand sanitizer business uh, about a year ago <laughs> because I, I truly envision like that from, from now until eternity, you're going to see hand sanitizer stations everywhere. You know, people aren't going to go mm-hmm. take those down. Um, but in terms of like actual shopper traffic, you know, obviously people have been cooped up for quite some time. So I do see a day that, you know, once once the masks are lifted, you know, I do think people will be starved and there'll be sub, a subset that, you know, still does not feel comfortable doing that. But I think there's going to be a lot of people that are ready to get back to, you know, mm-hmm. concert venues, um, you know, just be a, more social. You know, I think, I think we all miss that interaction to some degree. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I think having the ability to go to, you know, watch 
some live music or, you know, go to a movie surrounded by a bunch of other people to have that, you know, that feel, that environment. I do envision that coming back. And, mm-hmm. and again, I don't think that was consumer behavior that got to this point naturally. You know, I think it was just because of obviously the conditions. Yeah. And now when you guys look across your portfolio, um, what have you guys seen with lease rates? Have they held like in, in the office space? Um, what we've seen locally again, firsthand because we're, we're looking for space currently, um, rents haven't really moved that much. There's more mm-hmm. concessions. Um, but the, I think most of the landlords are looking at this as a sh- fairly short term impact and they don't want to, they don't want to adversely, uh, impact their long-term cash flow potential, right. And, and devalue their assets if they're cutting rents really, really steeply right now. So how, I guess, how have you guys seen rental rates or, or collections hold up across your portfolio? Any, any trends there that you guys are seeing or surprised by? No, you're, you're absolutely correct. I mean, it's the same thing. I think rental rates, they may have retreated slightly, mm-hmm. uh, but nothing material. Uh, what you have seen are more concessions and, and really that's to just get people who have expressed interest to make them feel comfortable that they have a long enough runway that they can you know, get through the c- current times. I mean, everyone's that that is going to sign a lease. I mean, particularly on the retail side, clearly they're optimistic and bullish about the future. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, they just are a little bit cautious about what's going on now and they want to make sure they have a safety net and a runway to get through this tough time. Um, so, so that's what we're seeing. We're seeing more of that most definitely. Yeah. But, but from a rental rate standpoint, no. And, and for the same reasons you said, right? Like once you, once you reduce a, you know, someone's rental rate by 50% and lock that in for five years, you're effectively throwing in the towel on your valuation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so switching back then to the acquisition side, are you guys looking at any different metrics now? Or does a, you said you deals that would eventually get to that core income kind of a profile. Um, how are you looking at acquisitions differently? Any different analysis you're doing or, or still pretty much sticking with the fundamentals of what you guys were up to before. We still look, we saw the same acquisitions criteria. I'll tell you what has changed is because of the experience we've had with a large sample size, such as our portfolio of, you know, 950 tenants, we know which uses have been most impacted. We mm-hmm. know which uses have been, I don't want to say COVID proof, but, you know, have been able to weather the COVID storm and, you know, still generate sales, um, you know, still attract customers, so that information absolutely has uh, infiltrated our underwriting and, and how we're looking at tenants on a new asset that we may be purchasing, mm-hmm. um, which has helped quite a bit. You know, there there are certain assets that that have that, that we've explored that we've immediately passed on because that tenant mix we know based on our experience that it has not performed well and it's probably going to be unstable for a while. Mm-hmm. Um, so you know, for those we're moving along right now, our focus for our deployment of equity is to make sure that we are, you know, being as, uh, conservative, but in a, you know, long-term way, right? Like we want to make sure that we're spending our money effectively right now. Um, so that has, has influenced the properties that we're looking at and, you know, the stuff that we are purchasing, the stuff that we have under contract is full of those tenants that we know have done well. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, from a, from a similar to what we were talking about on the leasing side, what we've seen from a lot of sellers, is you know pricing hasn't really moved much. Yeah, you know, there may have been like a ten to fifteen basis point uh, improvement for you know on the buyer side, mm-hmm. but but what you are seeing are more incentives from sellers. You know, so for example, you know we're doing our underwriting, we find a tenant that we feel okay about, but they may be a little bit shaky. You know, we we talk to the seller and say, here's what we're concerned about, and you know here's how we'd like to get around it. You know, if you're telling us they're fine. We think they're a little bit shaky. You know, let's just both you know, go in with, on this together. And, and we're seeing a lot of rent guarantees to get through some short-term pain. You know, the seller saying, hey, we understand. We believe in them. We're willing to, you know, put our money where our mouth is and provide mm-hmm. a guarantee, you know, on, on that revenue stream, which is getting us over the finish line in a lot of cases. Mm-hmm. And is there anything different now that makes something look attractive as an acquisition target for you guys that maybe you wouldn't have considered or weren't looking at before the health crisis? 
Uh, what do you mean? Can you give me an example? Um, I mean, again, outside of tenant mix, right? Is there anything with uh, programming of the space, anything with your geographic locations, any demographic information you guys are looking at differently, any you know, migration, okay. traffic? Like, gotcha. Have any of those, those criteria changed or, or anything that makes a property look more attractive now than it might have pre-crisis? You know, I, I see what you're saying. A great question. In the short term, I would say we're definitely paying attention. You know, obviously we've got properties all over the country, and so we've been tracking how different markets have responded to this. From mm -hmm. a, okay, you know, this particular market was much more aggressive in allowing their businesses to reopen, and you know, allowing them to open at you know a, a, a larger capacity. Um, understanding essentially, you know, more more pro business, and then some markets where the restrictions were you know, extremely aggressive and, you know, not quite as business friendly and, and we're more focused on making sure that there, there was less circulation, which, you know, I understand the, the balance of, you know, trying to keep the, the public uh, safe and healthy. And then, you know, also making sure that you're not creating another, uh, you know, issue by completely tanking a local economy. Mm -hmm. So that is, I would say in the short term, that has influenced, you know, where we're, focusing our efforts just because we want to make sure that we're, you know, buying a property where these businesses are going to have a reasonable chance of continuing to operate. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, that's, again, that's short term because we do, again, well, with all the progress that's being made, vaccinations, uh, obviously the changing in weather, getting warmer, you know, all of those factors we think point to this being, you know, uh, us at least seeing a light at the end of the tunnel. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, once, once that's lifted and we get back to a normal, environment, I think we'll be back to a you know, full national uh, perspective. But right now, it, it influences a little bit for sure. Mm -hmm. And then maybe taking a little step higher, just macro retail trends um, for listeners out there that are maybe either own some retail assets or looking at, at, at investing in some. Um, what are some of the factors to assess the overall health of the retail world right now? Where, where do you guys find those? How can listeners maybe track some of those uh, key points that you guys focus on? You know, I think um, absolutely capacity restrictions, what's going on in these markets, you know, national credit closures, who is, clo you know, which, which operators are closing stores, which op operators are declaring bankruptcy. Um, you know, and on the flip side of that, which stores are expanding, um, you know, changes in site requirements. You know, I'm not sure if you saw that recently. Starbucks kind of announced that they were moving to more of a, they're, they're going to put a lot more emphasis on drive through only locations moving mm. forward. Mm -hmm. You know, so I think those are the types of things that, you know, we continue to track just because obviously that's going to have a, a pretty big impact on our centers. Um, you know, in terms of where is that, did you ask that too? Where? Yeah, it's where, where can listeners start to track some of these different factors, any publications or any data sources that you guys find helpful that are accessible for listeners of the show? You know, we, there are a ton out there, you know, like the more real estate specific ones, like, you know, Globe Street and, and some of the, you know, depending on which market you're in, uh, market and product type, you know, the shopping center business, the Texas real estate business, whatever those may be, you know, obviously podcasts, you know, like have become very informative and a great source of obtaining information. And then, you know, the usual suspects like the you know, Wall Street Journal and uh, all of those folks that report on a lot of the big business moves. Mm -hmm. um, and then I guess, you know, as, as we sit here in early 2021, um, it sounds like, from what I'm hearing, you you would characterize the future of retail as still fairly positive. It seems. I mean, you seem fairly optimistic about the the state of the space, right? Um, maybe not as doomy and gloomy as a lot of the headlines would would lead us all to believe. Is that is that an accurate? I very much we are bullish on our space. You know, I think it is going to be an interesting next several years for the big mall operators, particularly those that may be in mid markets. Um, you know, not the I think the high end luxury lifestyle center product is still going to do fairly well. I think, you know, I'm, I'm curious to see what happens with the, some of the big box stuff, you know, you're, you're seeing a lot of this shift to more, again, that's where the e-commerce stuff is really coming in, you know, where you mm -hmm. have these places where you can just go to a showroom, but everything's shipping out of a less expensive, you know, warehouse location or, or a last mile location. But, you know, for the, for the product type that, that we believe in, 
it's it doesn't seem like well i'll say that i've, I've said it a few times so far and i'm not putting it past them because they've pretty much figured everything else out but you know amazon hasn't been able to figure out how to you know paint your nails do your hair right uh <laughs> you know those types of things so and, and that's those are the uses you find in our centers right you know mm-hmm. you've got those medical uses that want to be close to their customers like chiropractors uh, dentists uh, and then you've got the other convenience things you know dropping off the dry cleaning and i'm going to pick up a cup, cup of coffee while i do it and you know maybe grab some flowers for my you know, significant other at the same time and now, what are you guys watching most closely that would be an indicator either way, either to the good or, or to the bad? And you mentioned the, the health side of this, of course. We're starting to see some vaccine rollouts. Um, are there any other factors that you guys are paying close attention to that might signal either stronger recovery or, or maybe a slip backwards into into some more troubles? I would say restrictions, you know, what, mm-hmm. what kind of government mandated closures and restrictions, which have, you know, by and large been at the local or state level. So, you know, we track all of that information just so that we can make sure that our tenants are aware, you know, throughout this whole process, I will say one of the, I guess, if you want to call it a silver lining uh, has been how we've gotten more intimately familiar with our tenants. You know, we, when this all started, we formed this tenant pulse team to reach out and one, I mean, the first thing was just like to find out what was going on. You know, it was mm-hmm. you're getting all kinds of di- conflicting information. So everyone got a group of 40 to 50 tenants. We all started calling them, checking on them. You know, we were serving as information exchange too. Like, hey, this is what we're hearing in your market. You know, what have you heard? Because a lot of people didn't know if they were allowed to operate, what was going on there. So, mm-hmm. you know, we were acting as an information source. You know, we were acting as a you know counselor in some cases. You know, we got extremely familiar with the PPP program. So we were acting mm-hmm. as, you know, an information source as far as that goes. We developed, developed some uh, tenant resources to help with reopenings once those started, to help with, you know, some marketing. So, you know, I would say that's, again, going back and, and tracking the, the closures for us is something that's really important just so that we can know how to respond and, and what to prepare for. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then the other thing, you know, we're, we're definitely very much paying attention to what the vaccination adoption rate has been, you know, cause we're just as everyone else is, you know, we're very optimistic about, uh, how that is going. And then obviously very much looking forward to, uh, that, that number continuing to grow so we can yeah. return back to a very normal state. And then, uh, as we, as we round up here, what, what keeps you up at night? And then, uh, what are you most optimistic about here as the, as the year rolls on? Um, you know, I think that's it. I mean, for me, I'm I'm most worried. Going back to the closures, you know, that's the thing that most worries me because we've seen these our tenants, you know, a lot of the small business tenants, how stressful it was for them, mm-hmm. and they're, I mean, they're fighters. You know, they they very much a lot of these people. This is their primary source of income, so you know, they're going to do everything they that it takes to to stay afloat and continue to move on, and they've done that. Obviously. A lot of these folks aren't really making money right now. They're just surviving. And, you know, if they are making profits, they could be kind of thin. So, you know, just for their sake, we're, we're, I I worry about another sudden rise that causes some type of, you know, mass closure Mm -hmm. uh, because that could be really bad for them. So that to me is the biggest thing. Um, And and it seems, I, I don't, I don't believe that is going to happen. It does seem like even in some of the, states that, you know, maybe we're a little bit more aggressive with closures, both in terms of you know, how severe and how long. I think they're starting to realize that the long-term economic impacts that it's having of not allowing the business to op- be l- allowing these businesses to operate. So I don't envision that there will be this massive rollback. You know, we saw it here, you know, we're based in Denver and we saw it here over the winter, but there was a little bit of a spike and yeah, they tweaked the capacity restrictions down a little bit, but there was never a full shutdown. Mm-hmm. So I think as long as it stays like that and continues to make these incremental improvements, we'll, we'll be in a much better spot by you know mid to late summer. And then optimism again. Uh, I mean, what do you? I guess what are you most optimistic about um, as everything rolls out? Is there any um, anything that that maybe listeners might not think is is you know outside of the health recovery and general business recovery. Is there anything interesting that you guys are seeing or surprising that you're, you're kind of hoping for or pulling for or, or checking optimistically as, as the year rolls on? 
Well, you know, everything seems to be aligning. You know, the mm -hmm. I, I know the vac vaccination rollout was a little bit slower to begin with than everyone thought, but that seems to be picking up steam. You know, it's coinciding well with, you know, again, the changing of the seasons. Obviously, we're in the middle of winter right now, but, you yep. know, here in six to eight weeks, we'll be in the spring, which that timing could be extremely, uh, you know, th that kind of timing could work extremely well with where the vaccines are at that time. You know, and I think just the general mood of everyone being ready to be done with this. Yes. <laughs> you know, I know, I, I think a lot of people are really starting to say like, okay, you know, we've done this for a year. Um, you know, I, I've learned how to adapt a little bit, but you know, I'm ready, I'm ready for this to be done. So I think, I think yeah. all of that is syncing up well to where, you know, like I said, mid to late summer, things will look a lot more like they used to. Yeah. And I think the, unwillingness to accept this current state as the new normal, right? Right, exactly. <laughs> this is yeah, the, that's a great point. This is the current normal, um, but I don't think I don't think too many people are that thrilled about this being the long-term normal. So no. um, I think mean, just as social social beings, I, I agree there's definitely a lot of pent-up uh, excitement about getting getting back to some of those um, behaviors and just, you know, patterns that we, we used to enjoy before. So Hopefully, again, I think timeline is similar, you know, late summer, um, hopefully things should be aligning and we can get back to uh, maybe a more a more normal new normal than what we're currently in. Oh, I sure hope so. <laughs> well, Dusty, this is, uh, again, great recap of, of what you guys are seeing in the retail space. Um, anything that we didn't cover that you want to add or, or how can listeners learn more about what you guys are up to at Baseline? No, this has been great. I really appreciate the time and you know, great visiting with you guys. Uh, as far as what we're up to, you know, obviously you can visit our website, which is baselinegroup.com, and that's uh, B-A-C-E-L-I-N-E. -E. Perfect. And you, know, you can go check out a lot of the cool stuff we're doing. Great, and we'll have a link down in the show notes for everybody as well. So, Dusty, uh, again, really appreciate you coming on today and illuminating what you guys are seeing in the retail space. Thanks for, for spending some time with us. Yeah, thank you, guys. All right, listeners, that's all we've got for today. As always, if you have any comments or feedback, please send us a note to podcast at realcrowd.com. With that, we'll catch you in the next one.